Welcome back to Fair Play and my introductory series to the Factor Analysis of Information Risk Methodology. I'm Stephen Cardinal. By now, you should have a basic understanding of some fair risk terminology, the fair taxonomy, and how to calibrate yourself and your fellow analysts to create defensible estimates when performing a fair risk assessment. Now it's time to do the assessment, but where to start? The FAIR standard provides a structure for us to follow, which is what I'll cover in this video. The risk analysis approach includes the following. Identify scenario components or scope the analysis. Evaluate loss event frequency. Evaluate loss magnitude or impact. Derive and calculate risk. In the scoping process, we want to identify and document any assumptions we'll be keying off of. Anyone reviewing our analysis later must be informed of what the analysis encompasses. So if we analyze the likelihood and impact of a loss of availability of the patient data in our EHR, it needs to be clear that we're not including patient data that may be in other systems. We also must clearly define the asset. Is it our electronic health record system, or is it the patient data within the system that's the asset we're concerned about? If we're analyzing lost laptops, are we concerned with a $1,200 piece of equipment or the merger and acquisition plans that are on the hard drive? Who is the threat community we're concerned with? A rogue system administrator is analyzed very differently than a distant cyber criminal. How granular you go is up to you. Do I need to analyze individual nation state actors differently or can I group them all together? These are all discussions that will need to be documented. Next, define the loss event. The standard defines four threat scenarios that help malicious or intentional harm, error, accidental harm through an unintended action like a typo, a failure, accidental harm through an unintended result like buggy software, natural, such as acts of nature. In addition to these scenarios, you may want to include a vector such as via physical access, a phishing email, or web-based attack. Assets are often better protected against some vectors than others, just as some threat communities are better skilled with some vectors than others. Finally, what does the loss event look like? Is it a loss of confidentiality, like a data breach? Loss of integrity, like someone manipulating our pricing data? Or a loss of availability by taking down our website? After that, you'll parse the scenario to make sure its coverage is neither too broad, making it unwieldy, or too narrow such that it doesn't drive the necessary decision making. A scoping statement will look something like, analyze the risk of threat impacting the nature of an asset via a vector. For example, analyze the risk of a cyber criminal impacting the confidentiality of the patient data in our EHR via a phishing attack. Once our analysis is scoped, we identify the subject matter experts and start gathering data. We typically start with the loss event frequency. We can look at our historical records from our security operations and help desk teams to determine if there's an objective measure of event frequency. For natural events, we may be able to use historical data about hurricanes to drive estimates of frequency. We could use industry data if we don't have our own. Remember, to only go as deep into the model as you need to. It may be useful to discuss contact frequency and the probability of action to make sure your threat events frequency estimate includes the assumptions you're making, but you probably don't have to do estimates at that level. Now, once you've worked through the loss event frequency, you can begin working on loss magnitude. And this may involve a new set of subject matter experts, all of whom should be calibrated to provide reasonable estimates. Now, consider all six forms of loss. A part of the scoping of the left side of the model may generate data such as number of records breached in a confidentiality scenario, min, max, and most likely. This information may be important for loss magnitude estimates, as not all breach costs are linear. When you're done, you'll have a lot of numbers, percentages, ranges, most likely values. There's another part of estimates I haven't covered yet, which is the most likely value, the mode of our range. This is usually provided by the distribution from our Monte Carlo simulation, but could also come from the estimates provided by our subject matter experts. We will assign a confidence level in that number, however. We'll use a simple low, medium, high scale here to adjust our resulting distribution curve. I know, 
I haven't really gone into Monte Carlo simulations and result presentations. Much of that will depend on, upon the tools that you use to perform the actual analysis. Now, if you pick up the Hubbard book, he has links to some spreadsheets he developed for performing the analysis and presenting the results. A number of other vendors also provide tools to do the same. So in a future video, I'll see if I can demonstrate the freely available spreadsheets from Douglas Hubbard. For now, though, that'll be an exercise left for you. And that's really the next part of the analysis, running the numbers and making sure they seem sane. Look for typos, check assumptions. This part will be dependent upon what you use, whether spreadsheets or a third-party tool. But you'll come out with a likelihood of the loss event occurring expressed as an annual frequency, as well as a range of impacts with a low, a high, and a most likely number. If you've documented assumptions and included the appropriate subject matter experts, the result will be a defensible risk analysis that your leadership or you can use to make decisions. And that at a reasonably high level is the fair risk analysis process. Now, in a future video, I hope to walk through an example just to show how I might break it down using the taxonomy. It won't be a real world scenario, so it won't have lots of numbers and math, but should examine the approach and hopefully highlight the usefulness of the model, even if you still end up using qualitative measures and heat maps in your presentations. Until then, though, I hope you found this series helpful. As I'm still new to the FAIR methodology, I'm totally open to commentary in the comment section below. So if you've been performing FAIR for a while and you wish to share your experiences, please do so. Maybe we can even record a session together. Cheers.